We have the pleasure to have here with us uh, Stephen Legari. He is uh, art therapist coordinator at the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts, uh, and he is also a family therapy. And uh, well, Stephen, welcome with us. Thank you, Maria Julia. And uh, well, it's really a pleasure to have you with us. Uh, you, you came from Montreal, mm -hmm. and uh, we were very much impressed by what the Montreal Museum is carrying out with the, with the Medical Association of uh, Quebec. Mm -hmm. So the concept of medical prescription. Would you like to say, to explain to us what it is, this uh, medical prescription? Sure. So the, the prescription that we have with um, uh, the Association of Doctors in Quebec is a prescription especially for the museum. So the doctor has the ability to prescribe a visit to the museum. The patient can bring the prescription right to the counter, receive access in return, and there they can take ac uh, they can take in a variety of different opportunities. They can go with their family to a gallery. They can attend a creative activity. They could go to uh, uh, free activities for seniors. They can wander the art galleries by themselves if they choose and it's in its pilot phase meaning that we are in our first year and in year two it will expand beyond what we're currently doing so that doctors across Quebec can take advantage of it. I have a question for you. Sure. How did you persuade doctors, medical doctors, to prescribe uh, visits to art, to, to the beauty, to the museum? What was the secret? Um, persuading doctors uh, to help us create a museum prescription I think happened in two ways. One, on the strength of our programs that we've had for almost 20 years. Uh, programs that are for communities, for people that have different health care problems, uh, for people that have mental health problems. Um, but also that a number of doctors are already museum goers. They know the benefits of going to the museum. They know for themselves the benefit of art. They take in exhibitions, they go to events. This is already a part of their lives. So making the connection for them in some ways wasn't that difficult. How long did it take? Our program, the program. our program for communities started 20 years ago. Yeah. We had our first physicians participate uh, in my department, in my research projects, uh, about seven years ago. Okay. But the museum prescription is just a year old. Just a year old, uh, yes. yeah. And you're, you're waiting for the final results of phase one. Yes, so we're collecting information on how many prescriptions were filled, what were the months that the most patients came, what did they do when they were there? Yes. And what do they want when they come back? So we're putting uh, questions about, would you like to do an art therapy group? Would you like access to different kinds of activities? How did you notice your mood when you, when you left? Did it change at all? And then we want to hear back from doctors. What was it like to meet your patients after they had gone to the muse? What was, what was if any change in your therapeutic relationship with your patient now that you have this other thing that's in common and when will you expect to have the data some data to show so uh, in november of this year 2019 we're going to close the pilot project yes. we have uh, an external researcher physician who has agreed to evaluate the project and i suspect we'll start producing data in 2020. okay and um, yes, now you have been speaking about art therapy, yeah. yes? Mm -hmm. So, according to your knowledge, expertise, passion, opinion, mm -hmm. what is art therapy? Mm. Art therapy is the use and creation of art uh, to help people with a variety of problems, most specifically mental health problems. Uh, but it doesn't mean that it has to stop there. Um, so art therapy uses the practices and foundations of psychology and psychotherapy in combination with art making. Art therapists are experts in helping their clients reveal things through their art making. 
not by an analysis, not by telling the patient what they see, but rather inviting them to reflect on what they've created. Art goes past the cognitive, art goes to the felt, it goes to the soul. And so what a person is able to create um, is often things that are hidden to themselves. Our therapists work in a variety of approaches. Some are psychodynamic, some are cognitive behavioral, some are humanistic. But what they all have in common is the belief that art facilitates healing. Art facilitates us being able to move forward in how we want to feel. I believe that uh, art therapy can be used uh, beyond mental health uh, illness. I believe that it can be used uh, I would say in all conditions of fragility, vulnerability, also when there is a somatic disease yes. like cancer, mm -hmm. like a trauma, like um, a multiple sclerosis, like uh, neurological conditions as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, what do you think about this point? I mean, uh, because you have started with mental illness problems, mm -hmm. yes? But now, are you moving to investigate other conditions? Have you already investigated some other kind of conditions? So, art therapy has been art therapy has been practiced with just about every population and just about every condition that we can think of um, in clinic, in private practice, in schools, uh, and now in a museum. Um, so we are working with people that have long-term care. Uh, concerns, people that have long-term illnesses. Um, we just finished a research project with women who have breast cancer. Uh, we have another project with uh, people who are on the autism spectrum disorder, uh, which is a neurological, but we are also appreciating that people's physical health problems uh, can have a positive impact, can be positively impacted uh, through the creation of art, through the practices of art therapy. Um, not because we necessarily believe that we are affecting the cancer, but we also know that patients aren't just their diagnosis. They are in a state of crisis a lot yes. of the times. They are fearful. Yes. They don't have enough information or control. They are losing their identity. They are losing a sense of who they were before the diagnosis sometimes. And I believe that art therapy is a very valuable tool in helping them reclaim that identity, helping them work through the grief of having uh, a diagnosis, but also art therapy helps us escape. A lot of people will describe an experience of having been away while from the disease, exactly from the from their families, from their ruminating concerns. Ruminating thought, also I would say exactly from from the preoccupation with having an illness identity. Yes. Yes. When you are creating art, yes. you are an artist. I regard people as makers of art. They are artists. They are expressing who they genuinely are. Um, so we have worked with people with epilepsy. We've worked with people with cancer. Um, we've also been working uh, with um, a research team to develop a project for people that are recovering from stroke. And this will happen in a couple of months. And again, uh, I don't have the estimation that I'm going to have a huge impact on them reclaiming their physiological uh, Stay, state. Status. State, exactly. But if we can have a positive impact on their sense of calm, on being able to uh, uh, reduce their isolation, because a lot of people who have healthcare problems are isolated, they're isolated from themselves, from each other. Um, if we can bring them into an inclusive space, if we can show them something beautiful and if we can let them create, uh, then we might be helping to positively impact their trajectory. Okay, and uh, I learned from you that Montreal is a very, uh, I would say, uh, activist city mm -hmm. in terms of using art uh, as a catalyzer of social inclusion and social cohesion. Mm -hmm. You have these kind of hives, what you call hives, mm -hmm. yes? Uh, uh, apart from the Museum of Beaux Arts, mm -hmm. you have the hives almost everywhere in the city of Montreal. Yes. What is the meaning of, uh, of this hive and how do they help people to create both individual well-being and social inclusion? The art hives were started by a professor of art therapy 
who opened her first hive in Albuquerque, New Mexico, uh, more than 25 years ago. When she came to teach at Concordia University... What's, his na what's her name? Her name is Janice Timbotos. And she opened, as soon as she took her position, she opened her first hive in Montreal in a part of the city that is both working class, poor, and new rich all at the same time. And it's part of her mandate to build hives where they're needed, uh, where they can interrupt uh, or slow down gentrification, where they can have a positive effect on neighbors meeting each other. Um, in a, in a, a total way. different neighbor. Exactly. There is a huge diversity, I imagine. Exactly. So from that first hive, uh, she developed a model that was uh, based on dissemination. So think of a hive and think of the bees. Well, the bees went off to open other hives. Yes. Every hive is free. Every hive uh, is welcoming to the public. You don't have to have a diagnosis. You don't have to be alone. But you can have both of those things. You just get in. You just get in. You show up during the opening hours at whatever time works for you. You are warmly welcomed. So we practice what's called radical hospitality. We warmly welcome people in. We find what they need in terms of getting started. We pour them a cup of coffee. We introduce them to the other people at the table. And then we have a belief in their ability to make what they're going to make that day. You say we. Yes. Which is the competence that this uh, we should have? Um, there are art therapists working in hives. There are also artists, there are social workers, there are volunteers. I don't believe that this is exclusive to art therapists. I think that um, many lay people have the qualities. The lay uh, people as well. Exactly. So everybody. Yes. Uh -huh. And after people have been working in a hive, for, uh, they've been working for themselves, let's say, when yes. they've been working towards their own well-being, and maybe the social well-being of themselves and their neighbors of the community, you will see them spontaneously get up and start to welcome others. They take on that responsibility, one person at a time. Okay. What do you think about opening some micro hives in the hospitals? That's a great idea. Imagine <laughs> that there are patients who have to stay long time yes. intensive care unit for the for their caregiver. So, or I'm thinking about a spinal unit court where they have to stay for, for a long time, spinal mm -hmm. unit mm -hmm. for, for um, injury, particular traumatic injuries, mm -hmm. so, or any case in which they have to stay, well, either short or long period. Mm -hmm. So what do you think about opening kind of m micro hives also in, the, in these um, places where Generally, both the patients and the caregivers complain about the waiting time. Yes. There is a, like a waste of time. They feel like the time is always immense and never ending. Yes. So can we help us to, to spend this time in a more ple pleasant way? In, in, I think even in more than just a pleasant way. So art therapists have been working bedside for a long time. Bedside. Uh, so that, that this is, is one but this quiet. is different, exactly. Oh, is so quiet. to me, it's a natural extension that we could have spaces for patients, families, care providers. They are a hub. They are a place to meet. And if, if time is equal to pain, then the prescription is activity. <laughs> yes. So if waiting feels torturous, then why not do something with that time that gives you a sense of ease, a sense of creation when you're surrounded by uncertainty? Uh, so the idea of having hives in do you have them? medical institutions is, you have is coming. We so have, it's coming. It's coming. It should come also here. I believe, I believe <laughs> it could come everywhere. It's, yeah. And it's, it could definitely come here. We have uh, now examples of hives in a museum, in universities, in long-term care facilities. So imagine, you know, you've taken your, your loved one, they can't live autonomously uh, at home anymore, but in addition to all the other activities they have, they have a place where they can just come and create spontaneously. And maybe if you're coming to spend time with your loved one in a long-term care facility, you could do something besides just talk or watch TV. You can make something together. You can continue to be creative human beings. Yes. It's not complicated. And not like in a limbus phase, like in a, yes. uh, I would say, in, uh, 
in a very strange and different situation, completely yes. different, in a waiting, too yes. long waiting position. And, um, okay, you are an art therapist. Mm -hmm. uh, could you say uh, something about how space may impact our mood, our brain, our activities? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, do we have to live uh, uh, in ugly places? Can we cope <laughs> with the ugly places? Or is it better to live in uh, delightful places and uh, more beautiful places? I it l looks like a rhetoric question, but it's not. No. If, we, if I'm thinking to the normal hospital and uh, we should work a lot to, to bring into hospitals beauty. I mean, why are designers and architects interested in hospitals now? Why are they so interested in intervening in this spa these spaces to bring in nature, to bring in art, to bring in color, um, even in the way that they're designed to influence the flow of people? Uh, that when you walk in a hospital, um, it, should, it should... We talked about this uh, when we first spoke, that one of the first priorities is that somebody has the information that they need when they go to a hospital because that reduces their stress. But then how does the space help to take care of their experience? People have a right to beauty. People are impacted by beauty. They're impacted by light. They're impacted by sound. They're impacted by uh, how humans move through and use a space. Look at the way that we're redesigning libraries, for instance. Libraries are no longer a place just to get books. These are huge social hubs where families go to find productive activities. So I work in a museum, so I'm biased. I'm surrounded by beauty every day. But what I know from the people that have participated in my art therapy groups is that they chose to do this because it was in a museum and they've actually not partaken in groups in other places because they didn't feel good or because they weren't ready or there was not... I know that the environment that we're providing so, has, has a whole other impact. So you say that uh, if you are building up a hive in an ugly place, it won't work? No, I'm saying if you bring a hive to an ugly place, you're bringing in beauty. You bring in the beauty, yes. okay. But you should take care of the environment as well. Because environment as much as, as, much as you can. Okay, and you were talking about light and nature. Mm -hmm. How does nature impact our well-being? What do you know? Is mm -hmm. I know that in Japan they're, yeah. they're prescribing forest bathing. Yeah. Um, we have a partnership with a major park in Montreal you to have develop wonderful sequoias to develop, there, I think. Yes, <laughs> to develop a collaboration where people will come down from the mountain and into the museum. Um, so you call it forest bathing. Yes. Uh, Bagni di foreste. Wow. Yes. Uh, it's, it's my, this is a belief. It's my belief that we have um, a profound grief in our separation from nature. I, 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 I think we could probably I prove this Sigmund scientifically Freud if we could. It, yes. But it has been proven yes. because these Japanese people, uh, I think last year, published uh, a paper in which they're saying that after forest bathing, uh, people were uh, living much better, the anxiety was diminished, uh, depression yes. was diminished, uh, heart heart uh, beat was uh, uh, turning up to normal values, uh, blood pressure to normal values. So it has also therapeutic, really clinical therapeutic Absolutely. impacts. We know that gardening is therapeutic. Yes. We've studied this. Um, there are hives in Montreal that have community gardens in the back where people are free to interact with, this, with the outdoor space in the way that they need to, uh, to grow, to cultivate, to share. Um, but also to create art. So the effect of nature, I don't think, can be underestimated. Also as an art therapist, probably the most repeated images that I see in work are images of nature, images of parks, of trees. From your patients, vulnerable people, yes. migrants, refugees, yes. uh, the repetitive uh, uh, drawing nature symbols. Uh, yes, okay. often. Coming back to the grief, mm -hmm. yes, because there have been a separation between uh, uh, nature and civilization, let's call it like this, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the cities, uh, and also because in the nature we were living together, I think, also. Mm -hmm. This is uh, very much we part to. we had to. 
we had to be a clan, we had to live together. So yes. there is a double grief, one for nature, one perhaps because we are losing uh, our group, mm -hmm. our social cohesion. Mm -hmm. So we, sh we should uh, catch up with both the things, uh, I would say. I would agree with you. I, I, I think that our loss of a sense of community However you define that, you can define your community as that which is outside your door. Uh, it can be um, the group whom you uh, watch sports with. It can be the group that you make art with. It can be the group that you pray with. It can be the group that you make food with. But if you, it can be your extended family. Um, so not only do we need to reclaim a sense of community, we need to reinvent it because we we have to realize that our, our sense of community that we inherited from many, many, many generations may not exist anymore. Yeah. And so to grieve that, yes, but then also how do we take the best pieces of that and continue to share it once again? Who are our next community? Who's the next group of people yeah. that we will feel connected to? Are we going to leave to our sons and uh, to yes. the next generation? Yes. Okay. And uh, yes, looks like everything is magic in Montreal from here, from <laughs> the Italian point of view. Yeah, <laughs> looks like there are no difficulties in achieving what you want. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you wanted to get to medical prescription and you, you, you got it. Yes. So I'm, th I'm saying really, which way, because this may help us mm -hmm. in trying to understand how we can try to apply this concept of our prescription, medical prescription, social prescription, mm -hmm. that's not that's not the big issue. But mm -hmm. here, which were for you and for the people, who, for your team, for the people who were with you, which have been uh, the most difficult parts of this, uh, mm -hmm. of this victory? Was it bureaucracy? Was it was it, uh, lack of money, for mm. instance, lack of resources? Uh, if you have to think, uh, um, let's say, like uh, the most difficult part, who was it? Part of the challenge has been, um, I suppose you could say convincing. I don't know if convincing is the right word, but convincing people of the connection or the reconnection between art and health. People that are in positions of influence. Influencers. Yes. So it took many years to have the attention of the medical community, for instance. It didn't stop us from doing those projects. It didn't stop us from being community oriented or being client or patient oriented in our projects. We built them carefully one at a time. And in doing so, we had a foundation that when we finally gained the attention and the respect of the medical community, who I want to, who I want to respect as being people that don't have much time anyway. So when you're trying to gain the attention of people that are constantly overwhelmed themselves in their work, you have to respect the limitations that they're experiencing as well. So throw them a nice dinner, show them some nice art, Tell them about your projects. And, and show them some data as well. And show them some data. Now, I should also say that it's not every doctor that signed on. And some will, will certainly have negative things to say, oh, this, this isn't going to work. But so there is some the skepticism. Doctors. Absolutely, there's skepticism. And there should be skepticism. Debate is healthy. Um, but debate that just stops things in their tracks is not healthy. So fortunately, we have a high number of doctors uh, in and around Montreal that are excited about this project, that are excited about innovating, and are excited about being able to offer something. Show me a doctor that doesn't want to offer something more to their patients. We don't, the doctor doesn't have to do anything more than sign the prescription. They Instead of, of writing the name of a drug, uh, exactly. they just write yes. the name of a museum. If you're following the, the advice for your pharmaceuticals, if you're following the advice for your lifestyle changes, go out, take a walk, exercise, why wouldn't you follow the advice to go out and take in some culture, take in some beauty? If your doctor's telling you this, it's for a very good reason. Um, but getting back to the challenges, uh, one challenge that I find that might 
might not be exactly what you're asking about is that once you've so we talk a lot about social cohesion and social inclusion. Yes. Once you've invited people out of social exclusion and you've invited them into social inclusion, you still have to take care of them. So just them crossing the threshold into the space doesn't mean that everything's okay. They come with their histories. They come with the things that they're frustrated by. So they may come in and find it marvelous for a time, but you also have to keep being with them as they reveal themselves. So this, this can be very challenging. Are you going to follow these people for many years? In, your... in some cases, yes. So in the hives, we have people that will come consistently every week for years. Yes, because otherwise they're abandoned. That's right. Uh, yeah. So they, they, become, they become part of the environment, but then also the, the different pains that they're living with become part of that environment too. And we know that when you have more than a few people who have different pains, it can get a bit competitive for who's suffering the most. Oh, yes. So this is challenging. This is challenging. So it's easy to talk about how all of this work looks in a, in a presentation and on paper, but at the end of the day, we're still working one person at a time. We have to. What I find sad, and I say it uh, being an Italian, is that in Italy that we have something like 70% of the of the um, artistic uh, production all over the world, something like this, mm -hmm. uh, not 70, but uh, roughly 60 or 70, whatever. We are not able to organize this kind of things in a systemic way with the healthcare providers. Mm -hmm. And uh, my dream is that uh, uh, after your visit, after your witness here, um, apart from some particular oasis, I would say, in which this is possible. Mm -hmm. It's not a, a systemic approach still. There are still a lot of criticism and still a lot of uh, resistance. Uh, also, uh, particularly by uh, people who are in the bureaucracy part, in the bureaucratic part, they mm -hmm. think that, you know, the physicians have a kind of role, technical yep. role, then the art has a different role. So it's very difficult to, to build this bridge. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this is a, a thing that we are, have to work on and really going on and because we are, we know that the data are showing the evidence are showing that this bring benefits to the patients and not only to the patients but also to the carers yes, yes. so could you say just a couple of words more about prevention of burnout of uh, healthcare providers sure so I, I think the 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 next wave in all of our healthcare systems is going to be taking care of our healthcare providers we're already too late you know We've, we've waited too long to start looking at uh, the well-being of those that are providing care. Um, the doctors that signed on to our museum prescription are very proactive in prevention burnout for their members. Uh, and I think this was part of that initiative. This was part of looking at um, creative new ways. These are doctors that meditate. These are doctors that do yoga. These are doctors that do retreats. Um, and they're still working at their maximum, I'm sure. When you start to take into consideration the well-being of your healthcare providers, they are able to work better. They are able to pay closer attention to their patients. When a patient feels more cared for, their chances of feeling better increases. When they have more options that they can access in their community to help their well-being so that the doctor isn't responsible for all of it, then their prognosis is better. And if I can dream a little, I can also say that we're going to start to bring down the cost of health care because we have fewer people in burnout. We have fewer people that are um, on disability. We have fewer people that are unable to return to a quality of life that they desire for themselves or invent a new quality of life that they can because they're being given tools, reassurance, uh, reminded of their resilience, they're being treated as somebody who is a valuable member of their society. Yeah, so this will uh, improve our healthcare ecosystem. A hundred percent. Yes. Definitely. I'm convinced. Okay. Okay. 
Thank you so much, Stephen. I think that uh, really it was, it is great what you're doing there and we are waiting for the results of the pilot study November 2019. Mm -hmm. So we will be, I think, in connection later. <laughs> Absolutely. So to know the results of this uh, pilot, uh, pilot phase, but well, we are quite confident that uh, it will work and it is in interesting to see who are the patients who benefited, who are the patients who didn't benefit. So it would be very, very interesting to see this kind of uh, thing. And uh, thank you so much for being here. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.